So Nathan, uh, I heard the podcast you did with like Rob Pacey, and I love your content on the Instagram. But still, for those who didn't know you that much, can you like introduce yourself for the audience? No problems. Thanks for having me on your podcast, Eric. It's a it's a it's a pleasure. Um, so a little bit about me. So Nathan Heaney. Um, I guess preceding the the TCC or the Conditioning Consultant Instagram page, which has more recently been set up. Um, I had a fairly conventional introduction to strength and conditioning and sports science here in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I studied at one of the universities uh, in in Melbourne. And um, I guess through that journey, I um, I undertook a, a, a research project and a thesis, which um, looked at investigating the efficacy of using the yo-yo intermittent recovery test level one to assess aerobic fitness and determine maximal aerobic speed. Um, so for me, that was the the first foray into um, really delving into conditioning application. And the, the, the basis of that was trying to um, address a need in my current workplace, which was the Victorian Institute of Sport. So um, that was, that was, I guess that was the first foray into the real conditioning application and then from like a career and work standpoint, um, I've been in the strength and conditioning and sports science area for 15 years now across a multitude of environments ranging from elite um, elite uh, sportsmen and sportswomen all the way through to developmental athletes. Um, so I worked at the Victorian Institute of Sport for nine years um, before transitioning into working in Australian rules or AFL um for for three for three seasons with the Adelaide Crows uh football club and then more recently um uh we my wife and I um welcomed our first child into the world in 2019 and it was at that point that we thought we wanted to come back to Melbourne so we um we uh packed our bags and left Adelaide and came back to Melbourne and I started the head of athlete performance and development role at Xavier College in Melbourne and it's um for a bit of context, Xavier College is one of Melbourne's or Australia's leading independent or private schools. Um, and it's a school that has a really strong and proud sporting tradition and program. And for me, um, the reason for bringing me on board was some of our senior sporting programs were fledgling a little bit. So they weren't performing as strongly as they have historically. And one one gap that was identified by the principal and head of sport was that the physical preparation and the strength and conditioning programs supporting these elite or semi-elite programs at the school, they weren't up to scratch relative to other schools. So um, that was where I came into the school and pleasingly we've had some really good success with the introduction of me in that role across some of our key sports. Um, and then lastly, a couple of, I guess, two other things that are worth noting. Um, I started the conditioning consultant business in 2020. Um, and that stemmed from my wife actually prompting me to sort of start it, I guess. I had a bit of a reluctance to engage in social media, but I'm glad with the encouragement of her, uh, I was able to do so. It's been um, it's been incredibly well received and I've met some awesome people uh, along the journey, either through podcasts or through consultancy sessions or just through some of the online educational resources that we have available. Um, so that's been that's been awesome, and it's still going strong um, two and a half years later, and we've got a few ideas to try and um, increase its footprint, but um, obviously it's a bit of a challenge with time with two young girls and, and obviously a full-time job. Uh, and then lastly, I'm heavily involved in the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. So I've lectured... Uh, for, for the association for nigh on 10 years. Um, and I'm also the Melbourne based course coordinator. So um, that's an important cog in the strength and conditioning sphere in Australia because it's our main uh, accreditation body. Um, so it's important that we provide a really good platform for aspiring strength and conditioning coaches here in Australia. Nice, nice. Love that, love that. So today I kind of want to focus on like how should we be conditioning our athletes okay no matter it's like energy system or in-season off-season conditioning okay yep no so, problem so do you guys yeah. sorry sorry eric yeah so the first question would be like uh for can you like give us some like context about like how when it comes to like uh 
rugby team or like soccer team or like basketball team, how should we be conditioned, programming their conditioning, no matter it's like in season and off season? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So I guess the, the first thought I have is when we think about off season conditioning, uh, what phase of the off season are we considering? So is it off season whereby the athletes are um, training remotely and completing satellite type training? Um, or is it what what we would regard in Australia as preseason? So that's your your um, the, the athletes are back at the club or back in back in formal training and they're completing training under your guidance and you're supervising the sessions and that and that conditioning is conducted in conjunction with the technical training. So whether it be basketball training, rugby training, Australian rules training, whatever that might be. So if I start, if I assume that it's pre-season, um, for me, I I think about specific phases of of um, conditioning preparation. So, I um I for most cohorts and most groups, I would tend to use, uh, I guess, what would be regarded as a relatively basic linear periodization model for uh, for conditioning application. And for me, the rationale there is it ties in best with the technical models that the coaches are often wanting often wanting to implement. So. By virtue of that linear periodization model, I'll tend to use more general, um, general conditioning uh, types and methods initially in that in that in that general preparation phase. So that that's a that that ha- that lends itself to potentially some longer interval work or shorter interval work that's prescribed at mass or or below. That's achieved via manipulating the work to rest ratio um, to to make it um, more aerobically biased. And then over the course of that preseason preparation, as we transition from general preparation through to specific preparation through to pre-competition phase, the conditioning methods that I use progress in a linear fashion. So what I mean by that is there's an increase in intensity and a decrease in volume over the course of those phases. The reason I can do that is because as we make that transition, the technical training or the focus on the technical training is increasing alongside that. So there's more volume and time being allocated to the technical sport, which when you think about team sports is fundamentally important because all of those sports, basketball, rugby, soccer, Aussie rules, Gaelic football, whatever it is, they are fundamentally underpinned by technical components and skill. So you you can't be a successful team sport group or team unless you have addressed the technical components and the, and the nuances of the game plan and tactics and skill development that's required to, to fulfill and compete in those sports. So if I step back and then have a look at some of the conditioning methods that are used uh, over the course of those phases, they are generally faster. Often they are in their specific preparation phase, they are generally still aerobically focused but they're, they're aerobically focused through the lens of a more hybrid model. So what I mean by that is it might be short super maximal hit. Okay. So that's a combination of aerobic and anaerobic stimulus, but with the, with the overarching view of still improving aerobic fitness and aerobic power. Um, and then when we get to that pre-competition phase, I often like to almost target specific groups within the, within the team. So for example, there might be a subgroup that still needs to work on aerobic fitness because for whatever reason they haven't they haven't reached the requisite level of aerobic fitness that you've set out so they might still focus on aerobic fitness whereas with some of with hopefully with most of your group they've they've met the requisite level of fitness or or um they've they've reached the target aerobic fitness values or targets that you've set for those for those for those groups or positions they then can transition into more anaerobic type work um, so that can be repeat sprint, repeat effort. It can be short anaerobic super maximal hit work. That's a, that's a type of training that I like to to utilize. Or they can just focus more solely on their technical training. So you might say, in that phase, I'm actually I'm actually shifting out of specific running conditioning, and I'm going to I'm going to allocate all that time into the technical training, small sided games, and I'm banking on the fact that those bouts of um, small-sided games or those that technical training will maintain 
the aerobic fitness that I've developed over the preceding phase. Um, so that's, that's I guess, a pretty long-winded answer around approach to preseason. The only thing I'll mention around off-season is um, if it is off-season and you are prescribing a program that is done in a satellite fashion. So what I mean by that is in for Australian rules, for example, over the Christmas phase, there's a, there, uh, and even before that, there's a big chunk of time where the athletes are still engaged by the club but they do all their training by themselves. So that's that would be common across the world for, for, for high-performance athletes and even some elite athletes. My, my biggest advice to practitioners and coaches when they encounter situations such as this is provide or devise a program that maximizes compliance. So I think what coaches often do during those phases is they try and prescribe something that is more suited to a pre-season phase, which requires your supervision and your guidance and your expertise. And that becomes problematic because if you try and prescribe that type of program in the off-season when they're not with you, they won't do it. Okay, so I always say simplify the program, have compliance at the forefront of your mind. And if you're getting 80% of the group completing 80% of the program in that phase, you've done really well. And then that sets that lays the foundations and sets good habits for when the guys come back to you, they've you can be confident or more confident that they've done more work. And then that means you can be a little bit more aggressive with your, your training prescription um, when they return to formal preseason training. Um, and then lastly, obviously the question around in-season conditioning is a really interesting one because I would say it is very cultural. So what I mean by that is there are some sports whereby in-season conditioning is ingrained in their culture. So I would say, think of rugby union, for example. It's much more common for, for rugby union clubs to perform in-season conditioning as part of their week-to-week their -week structure. And I think a part of that is it's the, the Canterbury Crusaders who have been such a powerhouse in that competition, they implemented quite a unique model whereby they used... Um, in-season conditioning quite regularly and were really successful doing it. So that laid the foundations for other clubs to go, well, hang on, we might try and implement a similar model because it's been successful for them. If I think about in-season uh, in season for an AFL team, there is a real reluctance to complete in-season conditioning, even though that in-season phase can span six months, six to seven months. So that's definitely long enough to see a significant detraining effect, in, particularly when you think about aerobic fitness and, and even some of the anaerobic qualities as well, despite they, despite the fact that they try and maintain some of those through uh, plyometric work, strength training, power work in the gym, et cetera. So um, the, the only other point I'll add around in-season considerations, if you are going to prescribe in-season conditioning, I always like to think about it through the lens of how do you maximize the physiological stimulus that you're trying to um, obtain and elicit whilst minimizing the cost of that? So how do you minimize the mechanical loading? How do you minimize the blood lactate response to the session? How do you minimize the... Uh, the RPE and the perceived, the perceived exertion from the athletes for the session. So they're big considerations for me when I prescribe in-season conditioning. And that has a big impact on what types of sessions I'll often use if I do go down the path of prescribing some in-season conditioning. Great, great. So uh, you mentioned like probably at the beginning of the season, you're going to use like a uh, mass Right, am I right? Yep. So, uh, can you like give us some more detail about like what exactly is like maximum aer maximum aerobic speed and how should we like test it and how should we like program it? Yeah, so that's a a great question, and I guess, um, interestingly enough, it was probably formed the foundations of the of the Sportsmith, um, podcast and obviously the article because, um. As you're aware, Eric, and we obviously had a bit of a discussion before we went live here, 
Um, unfortunately, maximal aerobic speed is is largely misunderstood by a lot of practitioners. Um, so yeah, so in in essence, maximal aerobic speed is an intensity measure. So it 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 originally it originates from the the term velocity VO two max. So that was a, a, a an intensity measure that was that was obtained in the lab through some pioneering pioneering work done by Veronique Bilat um, way back in the the believe in the late eighties early nineties. So it's been around for a long time, and that's the concept velocity of VO two max. Now the issue with velocity of VO two max was that you needed to complete a VO two max test in a lab and have a met card and all sorts of other pieces of equipment to um, accurately determine it. So for most practitioners and most coaches, they don't have access to that. And also for team sports, it's impractical to test athletes and not really relevant to test athletes in that in that medium anyway. So that's why um, maximal aerobic speed, the intensity measure was introduced because everyone saw the benefit of using VBO2 max to prescribe training for middle distance runners and, and the like. They were like, well, how do we use the same concept, but with team sport athletes and in the field? And hence, um, maximal aerobic speed was introduced. So maximal aerobic speed is determined using a multitude of different field-based aerobic fitness tests. Now, I won't go into the intricacies of all the different tests because that'll literally use up the rest of the time that we have on the podcast. But all I'll say is that there are certain tests that are much more valid and reliable for the purpose of determining maximal aerobic speed um, versus others that are much more unreliable. Now, there are I, I can empathize with people in the sense that when you work at a certain club or work with a certain sport or work with a certain head coach, sometimes the decision around which test you're going to use or which test you are forced to use is not always your decision. So by virtue of that, there are a whole host of different regression regression equations that are available to try and improve the validity and the reliability of the maximal aerobic speed obtained from those tests. And the reason that is so important is because if in if you go down the path of wanting to consider using maximal aerobic speed to prescribe your conditioning work, if you get the first step wrong, and that is determining an accurate maximal aerobic speed value to prescribe off, you're already you, you're already starting from a long way back. It's basically impossible to use mass effectively if your mass value is wrong. Okay, so that that I cannot be clearer with that, and I think that's something that's really misunderstood. People, uh, I see quite often, people try and determine maximal aerobic speed use from field tests that are not valid or reliable. Um, and then then try and then they worry about, well, uh, is my session prescription effective? My response to them often is, well, your mass is wrong to start with. So it doesn't matter how effective your prescription is because the basis of your prescription is wrong. So yeah, so that's, that's um, maximal aerobic speed. That's obviously... Uh, a bit of a um, a bit of an introduction around and testing. Um, I'll, it's probably worth noting that I often will use. Um, there's obviously a, probably three tests that I would commonly utilize. So um, a time trial is used quite often in the sports that I work with. So Aussie rules um, culturally, time trials are incredibly popular. Um, so probably the main one that I use there is a 2K time trial, um, and there's been a few studies that have. Um, highlighted that it is reasonably um, accurate in terms of maximal maximal aerobic speed determination, but you've got to be really um, mindful of how you administer that test. So that 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 definitely has an impact on the accuracy of your determined mass. Um, and the other two tests are a maximal aerobic speed test, which is a I guess a derivative of the University of Montreal track test. So that's essentially imagine like a big test, but done around a track. So that's almost, I would say that's the gold standard field test for MAS determination. And then the other one I've used, which is the one I've studied is the yo-yo intermittent recovery test level one. Now the raw MAS value that you'll get from a yo-yo IR1 will overestimate MAS. 
So there are there is a regression equation available which I've published um, that uh, addresses this overestimate overestimation. And uh, once you use that regression equation, you get an MAS value that is much more akin to an accurate MAS and corresponds with velocity of VO2 max. And as such, you can be really confident that you can prescribe um, conditioning using that MAS value really confidently um, because that's important. You, you Essentially, you try, when you think about VVO2 max as being the gold standard measure, MAS, you tr the MAS you're trying to determine should be as similar to that as possible. That's that's what we're trying to do when we determine MAS. Um, and then the, the, obviously the, the second layer to that question is prescription. Now that is a that's a big topic, um, and I guess there's there's lots of confusion around um, prescribing conditioning using MAS. Now that's for me that was the basis of some of the online educational resources that I've created. So I created um, a three part conditioning workshop. So part one revolved around determination of MAS and some introduction to underpinning research for conditioning application and aerobic fitness. Workshop two or part two revolved around hit prescription. So that was 90 minutes devoted to prescribing training using MAS and then a few other layers. So you're utilizing MAS for tempo or um, what other methods you can use for tempo prescription as well. And then part three or workshop three was, um, was pitched at conditioning periodization. So again, fundamentally important. It was one of your first questions here. So when I when I speak to practitioners that are keen to learn more, that is always my go-to recommendation because it lays it's four and a half hours of online education for conditioning that's pitched at the right level. And I've got lots of experience in this space, and especially lots of experience trying to educate aspiring SNC coaches, or in actual fact, um, really established SNC coaches that just haven't paid proper attention to conditioning. So it's always been a bit of an afterthought. It's a bit ad hoc. And then once they undertake this course, they are blown away by the level of detail in the course. And then by virtue of that, it then flows into the way they prescribe their conditioning. Um, so yeah, in terms of conditioning prescription, I, there's probably not much more I can add other than like, I think that's a great recommendation for most people that are interested in the area. Um, I think there's so many layers to hit prescription using MAS that um, it's it's hard to provide a really specific answer. But I think mass for me is an incredibly versatile intensity measure that can be used to prescribe conditioning for endurance athletes or team sport athletes. So that's, that's, again, misunderstood. Like people don't understand that. And it can be prescribed, it can be used to prescribe conditioning right across the intensity continuum. So what I mean by that is I've used MAS to prescribe conditioning for endurance athletes and team sport athletes doing an easy run. I've also prescribed MAS for short interval, long interval, short aerobic interval, short anaerobic interval, short super maximal hit, short anaerobic super maximal hit. You know, I've used it all across the intensity continuum and it ranges, that's about a, when you look at percentage of MAS, that that range can be about 60 to 70% across all of those sessions. So it's an incredibly versatile measure. It's also not the only way to do and prescribe conditioning as well. I definitely acknowledge that. But I think for me, MAS comes into its own when you are working with teams and large groups because in my experience and looking at the research, it is the most effective way to induce an effective and consistent conditioning stimulus, irrespective of the goal you're after, but particularly for um, aerobic fitness adaptation. Great, great. So uh, besides like uh, maximum aerobic speed, I want to ask as, as well, like, how about like the anaerobic speed reserve? What are your thoughts on this? How should we be like also tested and programmed with like HIIT? Yep. Great question, Eric. So um, anaerobic speed reserve. So if I, if I take a little bit of a step back, so um, I've already touched on 
the conditioning workshops that I'd created and that have been incredibly popular. The more recently, I uh, it was probably last year, probably mid last year, I, I released an anaerobic speed reserve webinar. And that was because um, for a lot of practitioners, once they've got that foundational level of conditioning knowledge, especially when you work in team sports, you inherently prescribe a lot of um, conditioning that is short interval. And it's also short hybrid interval or short super maximal interval. That's an incredibly popular session type. For some of your listeners, they might recognize that as Eurofit method. That's 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 commonly what it's referred to. I call it short, super maximal, high intensity interval training. So an example might be 30, 30. So 30 seconds of work, 30 seconds passive recovery at 115% MAS or 20, 20, 15, 15, 10, 10. The work to rest ratio is one to one and it's prescribed above 100% MAS. Generally between... 115 and 120 is kind of the sweet spot. So that is really popular. What happens though is when you prescribe that type of work and you've only got and you're only using MAS, what I find and what I found, and I've done plenty of research on this, and again, I'm happy to share that with you as well if, if you want. Um, you'll find that when you if you just use your MAS groupings, you start to get some inconsistencies in terms of the way athletes complete those types of sessions. And that is because faster athletes are much more suited to this type of work than their slower counterparts. So I had quite I had a bit of an epiphany about 10 years ago when I was prescribing some of this work. And that led me um, to, to investigate the application of ASR with team sport athletes. And by virtue of applying ASR, it rectified and addressed those inconsistencies and it resulted in a much more consistent stimulus. Okay. So that's sort of the background on it. What is it? It is to, to, to effectively use it. Um, you have got to have someone's maximal aerobic speed and you've also got to have someone's maximal sprinting speed. So to, to work out anaerobic speed reserve, you are simply um, minusing someone's MAS from their max sprinting speed. So an example might be if someone's got a max sprinting speed of 30 kilometers per hour and their maximal aerobic speed is 15 k's an hour, their anaerobic speed reserve is 15 kilometers per hour. Okay. That value is then integrated into the prescription with some of those shorter super maximal intervals or those short anaerobic super maximal intervals. Okay. So that's the basis of it. And I've used it effectively across a multitude of sports and environments. And when you're prescribing that type of interval work, so super maximal and anaerobic super maximal hit, it makes a massive difference. I cannot I, I cannot exaggerate that enough. It is really important because if you just rely solely on um, percentage MAS for that type of work, you will significantly disadvantage slower athletes what I mean by that is they'll find those sessions incredibly difficult, much more difficult than they should. Conversely, you will understimulate faster athletes. And what I mean by that is they'll find that short super maximal work too easy because they've got such a big speed reserve. Okay. So that's that's a that's a intro into um, anaerobic speed reserve. It can be a little bit of a complicated topic when you start to think about how you applied for prescription. Again, I've that anaerobic speed reserve webinar that I have recorded and is again has been utilized extensively by lots of elite SNC coaches around the world. Um, I would highly recommend people look at that. Again, I'm happy to send the link through to you, Eric, and you can enter it in the show notes. Um, the Instagram page, the TCC Instagram page is obviously um is a, obviously a good vehicle to find that information as well. But it that's 90 minutes of content specifically around anaerobic speed reserve application in team sport athletes. Um, and people, some people sort of have a bit of uncertainty around where, when, where ASR can be applied. So if you think about any sport, any field sport that has a significant high speed running demand, so think of soccer, Aussie rules, Gaelic football, 
both rugby codes, so union and league, like those sports, ho- uh, field hockey, you know, those sports are so suited to the utilization of anaerobic speed reserve because the conditioning you apply will always gravitate towards that shorter interval work, especially in di- in certain components of the of the of the periodization phase. So think of specific preparation or pre competition phases. Love that, love that. So, uh, besides like the anaerobic speed reserve and the MAS, you also mentioned like you're gonna do some like a uh, long HIIT or like short short HIIT, right? So, can you like give us an example, like what type of like HIIT you're gonna implement it when it's like a uh, preseason and how? Sh- should we do it? Should we be programming the short HIIT during the season? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So I'll give you so like if we start with a preseason example. So let's call it general preparation. And when I work in teams, like with groups, I always would tend to use time-based intervals or duration-based intervals, and that's because they're much easier to implement and administer in large groups. So when I'm talking about large groups, I've worked with groups that have upwards of 80 athletes running at once. You know, that's that's a real logistical challenge. So uh, so an example might be even with those 80 athletes, the challenge is how do you induce a consistent stimulus for them? So I might prescribe six to eight reps, depending on the volume that I that I'm after, of two minutes of work. Let's say it's anywhere between 97.5 and 100% MAS, and it might be prescribed at a two to one work to rest ratio. So, one minute walk recovery or passive recovery. Okay, so that's an example of um, a longer interval session that would be really well suited to the general preparation phase for a team sport group. Now, when you think about if you have five or six groups within your, your squad, what happens is the different MAS values correspond to a different distance for the two minute rep. And that's how you achieve that incredibly consistent stimulus across the group because everyone's working at the same relative intensity. That is really hard to achieve when you use other intensity measures to prescribe your conditioning. So think of if you prescribe subjectively and you say to your group, I want you to run those two minute intervals at 80% effort the question you'll get back is, oh, how hard's 80%? You're like, and you you feel that question 55 times and it's incredibly frustrating for you as a coach because it adds layers of complexity that you don't need to worry about. And it also results in an inferior stimulus because the athletes are confused. They don't know how hard they need to work. Um, so that's an example of long interval. And then if I think about short interval and I think about the application of the in-season or pre-season, um, the type of short interval um, will will obviously be impacted by the phase. But if I give an example of uh, one that would be relatively well suited to um, both pre-season and in-season. So let's talk about a short interval session. It is straight line, so no change of direction. Okay. So that's that's important to reduce the, the mechanical loading and the metabolic cost because we know change of direction, eccentric loading, and re-acceleration up to every change has an impact on session RPE, blood lactate, type 2 fiber recruitment, all of those things that have an impact on conditioning application. Um, so those considerations in mind for in-season and also when you think about pre-season, we're trying to maximize the aerobic stimulus, uh, more specifically aerobic power. So how do we how do we maximize the ability of your muscles to utilize oxygen? So um, I'll use like a, a, a basically a three to one short interval or shorter aerobic interval session. So it might be 45 seconds of work with 15 seconds of passive recovery. And I might do two sets of six to eight reps, depending on the volume allocation that you've got, the group you're working with, their status. Okay. And again, same philosophy. MAS values um, across your groups correspond to a different distance. Um, and again, that's a that's a session that I've applied across a multitude of different groups. Um, so again, I I can't stress that enough. 
incredibly effective. And hopefully those two examples um, give you a bit of an idea as to the, the different um, ability or, or the, sorry, the, the breadth of the ability of MAS to be applied. The one thing I probably should touch on, given that we've spoken about it, is if we're in pre-season in a specific preparation phase and I wanted to use short super maximal hit, there's two examples. The, the inferior option is just to use MAS. So let's call it 15 on, 15 off at 120% MAS, okay? The alternate option is trying to, identify, or trying to ascertain what mass plus percentage ASR equates to 120, and then you prescribe off that. So I'll give you an example that I've used with a team I'm working with at the moment. So instead of 120% MAS, I'm using mass plus 22.5% anaerobic speed reserve, and that is my prescription for those 15 second periods of work. Okay, again, probably hard for people to contextualize if they're not au fait with some of the, 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 the intricacies of conditioning application and in particular anaerobic speed reserve. Hence why I would encourage them to look at the TCC uh, Instagram page or the website. And then again, if they're really interested for upskilling in, in learning more, upskilling themselves, yeah, undertake those courses. They are, you know, they've been used a lot by lots of really well credentialed and experienced um practitioners across the world great great so uh besides like uh mas or like an anaerobic speed reserve can we like uh just simplify that by using like heart rate is it possible to like simplify those with just heart rate and use it like heart rate zone to like program our conditioning throughout the whole throughout whole year yep that, that, Eric, that is a terrific question. Um, I would say it depends on the group you're working with. So if you're working with team sport groups in a in a team sport setting and one that has 20, 30, 40, 50 athletes, whatever it is, I would say the inclusion of heart rate can actually add lots of complexity to the prescription. And the reason I say that is because it is, an inc- like whilst it's an incredibly valuable measure and metric, and it's a great indicator of internal load. It adds layers of complexity because it is impacted so greatly by things that you can't really control. Environmental conditions, their stress, their well, their fatigue and freshness you can control, but cognitive fatigue and load you can't control. Like someone's had a bad night with their kid, they've had two hours sleep, that's going to have an impact on their heart rate response the next morning. You can't control that. So um, those things are, whilst it's such an important aspect, I have trialed it and used it and I've used it for an entire preseason at an AFL club. It was, it was useful, but it did not change the way I prescribed using MAS or whatever method I was using at the time. And most of my conditioning does largely revolve around the application of maximum aerobic speed, but I don't always use that method. Um, so it's, I think in that context, it's used retrospectively to assess how effective was the session? Would we make any changes? But uh, again, in a team sport setting, I don't find it overly useful. If I'm working with through TCC, the business, if I'm working with endurance athletes, I'll use heart rate a lot. And the way I use that is to guide different intensity domains. So for example, if I want them to complete an easy run, an easy 40-minute run, an easy 60-minute run, I'll set them a heart rate cap. So I'll give them an easy, what what I've identified as their easy heart rate zone, and I'll say, don't let your heart rate get above this particular heart rate for this easy run. Or conversely, if I'm trying to prescribe a high-intensity interval training session for those individual athletes, I'll say, let's try and hit these paces or run or hit this distance. And then we're also, in addition to that, we're trying to maximize the amount of time spent above a certain heart rate. So we achieve a certain amount of time above 90 or 95% heart rate max. And I find in that setting, heart rate is incredibly useful. Great. I love that. Love that. So uh, besides like those like, uh, topics besides mass besides like 
anaerobic speed reserve or heart rate? Is there other way to like condition an athlete? Oh, of course. Like there's, uh, there's a multitude of different ways. So you can use fart leg training. Again, that's a more subject, subjective method for prescription. If you're working with endurance athletes and middle distance runners, that is going to be an incredibly effective way to do it because they've got this innate ability to pace effectively, irrespective of what you throw at them in a subjective manner, because that's what they do. The issue is when you try and utilize subjective conditioning prescription for team sport athletes that don't have the same innate ability to pace, you get lots of inconsistency with stimulus. So that's why for me, I, I when I work in those settings, I don't tend to use a lot of fat leg training because it is subjective and does create a lot more complexity and a lot more error with the stimulus that I'm trying to induce. Um, there's technical training or small-sided games. So your actual basketball training, soccer training, Aussie rules training, hockey training, that all has a conditioning effect. It all induces a conditioning stimulus. The issue I find with games-based conditioning or technical training is that, again, it results in a very inconsistent stimulus. So what I've seen through some case studies that I've done and some research that I've read, um, if you imagine a small, like a small-sided game for a group of 20, but for five of those athletes the small sided game might have induced an incredibly effective aerobic fitness stimulus for that for them because they worked really hard they had good intent they played in positions that warranted high levels of exertion however you might have three or four athletes that had a really inferior um, conditioning stimulus induced and that's because they're inherently lazy they play in a position that doesn't have a high um, work rate. They were they were they were playing a particular role in that small sided game. You know, those things are, in, are inherently have a massive impact on on um, the outcomes, the physiological outcomes from small sided games. So again, there, there's there's times where the physiological um, outcome is secondary. So you know that you're compromising aerobic fitness development or anaerobic development or speed development because you are prioritizing the technical skills, skill development, structure, game plan. These are things that the coaches want to prioritize. So you just need to know when is when is physical outcome the priority and you plan and you execute and you periodize accordingly. And then when it flips and the technical model and your technical training is the priority, how do you then reprioritize and change so that you are giving due time and um, and you're giving enough priority to um, the technical training because remember that is the most important aspect your role as an SNC coach or sports scientist or a practitioner working with those teams is to lay the physical foundations that enable the coaches to execute a game plan that will na- enable them to be as successful as possible and if all you do is mass running and you don't do any technical training that's not going to be overly effective. So it's trying to, you know, that there's lots of layers to this, but obviously we have a, a sort of a, a short time frame. But um, there, there are a couple of different examples. Um, there's obviously repeat sprint training, which is pretty popular. Uh, again, for me, like it's not a bad anaerobic stimulus, but if you do it running and, and actually sprinting, there's lots of inherent risk there. So what's the risk versus benefit ratio? How willing are you going to be to risk someone tearing a hammy in a repeat sprint session? You know, like that, that's that's the risk versus reward. If you do repeat sprint training on a bike, it's a different kettle of fish. It's non-specific if you're a running based athlete, but it might be, it might, it might induce an incredibly effective anaerobic glycolytic stimulus because and with very little injury risk. Because there's, you know, it's a much safer mode to complete those methods. So, um, and then the last one is obviously cross training. So that's useful to top up aerobic fitness or or different um, energy system uh, qualities that you might want to address. However, for me, it's non-specific. You know, we want to try and train in task-specific modes. Um, 
but it has a place depending on the circumstance. So if someone's injured, of course, it's much better than nothing. If someone's um, deficient in a particular system and you feel like uh, providing them with extra conditioning to address this, I think that's okay, provided it doesn't compromise technical training time or doesn't compromise their their actual um, – it doesn't compromise their actual running conditioning that you're doing with them because – that's the most effective mode of training that you will do with them. So, yeah, there's, uh, I guess, an overview of some other options that you've got. Um, but, yeah, again, yeah, there's probably a few more that I've forgotten um, and and probably that we don't have time to discuss as well. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's kind of like all the question I have for you today. So uh, for those, like, because conditioning is, like, like we discussed before is like miss i know it's miss i don't know it's if it's misguided or like misused in our field so for those who are who want to like uh uh contact you or want to find out where the online webinar or like the online workshop is where where can they find it and where can they reach out to you yeah um so, Eric, so probably the first point of call would be the Conditioning Consultant Instagram page. So it is just at the Conditioning Consultant. Um, so that's um, that's sort of a main vehicle for people to uh, sort of see some of the content that I've produced. And you can also find um, there's a few layers to the business, I guess, like there's all the online educational resources. So there's the three-part conditioning workshop package there's the as anaerobic speed reserve webinar and then there's also um a gps um team sport gps webinar as well which is incredibly popular because um the advent of inexpensive gps units has meant that more and more clubs even sub elite clubs are using gps in training and i often find a host a whole host of issues with the application of that again not for today but that's an example of the the online educational resources that I've got available and that have been used right across the world, which is, you know, probably one of the things I'm most proud about with the business is the ability to educate and upskill um, eager and aspirational and uh, enthusiastic practitioners that have identified a gap in their conditioning knowledge and they see me as a trusted source of information and guidance for that. Um so yeah, so the, the that website, uh, sorry, that Instagram page is obviously a go-to, um, and there's heaps of free um, information on there, which is incredibly valuable for anyone that's that's wanting to learn more. Um, we've got the conditioning consultant website as well, so um, just Google it or uh, it's the conditioningconsultant.com.au. Um, so that's there's heaps of information on that website. Um, you can obviously contact me via Instagram DM or send me an email. So um, Nathan at the conditioning um, so that's that's uh, probably the main method um, yeah and I guess there's also uh, some other we've got a TCC YouTube channel which again I don't use a lot um, there's a couple of webinars that I've recorded that people have um, also wanted to wanted me to put on there so again that might be the case Eric where I could share this um, on there as well and hopefully then people find it and then come to your podcast um, and your YouTube channel as well because you've got heaps of great stuff and some awesome um, guests on your show as well which which again people can um, benefit from so yeah I think that that's that's it mate that's um that's where people can find me and yeah again if they're interested in conditioning application hopefully um, you know I've built up enough reputation and trust that people can um, utilize the resources and content that were produced and and um, hopefully the, this conversation is the impetus for some people to to take the leap and um, in, and uh, invest in their own education in conditioning. Yeah, cool, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. 